So, I'm going to run the trailer. Yeah, I'm running all the trailers. So, okay, so do you want me to introduce her before the trailer? Or you'll put the trailer and then I'll come up and introduce her. Because Anna will be introducing the whole thing. Yeah. So maybe she can say something about the trailer first. Right. Uh, told me that the introduction is actually more sense to play the trailer. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that when I introduce her, she comes to the stage. So I'm going to tell that to you. Okay. okay, great. So we are all set for live streaming. Um, okay, perfect. Now, you, are you doing... Uh, like a split screen or a mirror? Like, uh, no, so I mean, it's streaming from here anyways. Yeah. And uh, so I'm not going to be doing split screen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh,
That's the sign that's right here that says go that way. Thank <laughs> you. 
Yes. That takes a while. It's my pleasure to introduce our first author of the afternoon, Mylinda Bashlari. Mylinda was born, raised, and educated in Tirana, Albania. Her first collection of poetry, A Road to Home, that's the title and translation, and I'm not going to venture to pronounce it in Albanian, was published in Albania in 2007. My Linda's work has appeared in numerous Albanian art and literature magazines, in Albanian anthologies of essays and short stories, and in international publications. My Linda now lives with her family in Toronto, works as an accountant, and is also currently working on a second collection of poetry in English as well as a novella. Please welcome to the stage My Linda Bashlari to read from her searing and lyrical first. English language collection of poems. Love is a very long word. Melinda? Good evening, everyone. 
before I start reading a few of my poems from the book, I want to thank, to say a thank you, a big thank you to Guernica Editions for making it possible for my book to be published. Thanks to Michael Havana, a Lambert's master, for her precious help. And thanks to Gabriel for the awesome trailer. <laughs> The first poem that I'm going to read is called Winter Cinema. Our desire to go to the cinema was the first sign of winter. New heroes arrived in town, and the playground in front of our building lost its importance. It was a love story in war, too heavy for our little hearts, too intense for our silky minds. Famous stars from a foreign country, pretty faces, messy syntax, strange gestures. This cold theater, dark all the time, shadows jumping from the walls, creaking of wooden chairs, air warmed by childish breaths. We were sitting there, uncomfortable, as in a painful sleep, in a bed of cacti, stuck on thorns, in the teeth of night. It felt as if we were bleeding and snuffed. There's no more to recall, or maybe my short memory managed to erase it all, except the disgust when, absorbed in the happiness of the movie heroes, I missed the tears in Albana's big eyes. In the dark, she cried and shivered as the hand of the man seated next to her parted her little thighs. The second poem is called Escape Story. It took us one night to become two little diasporas, escaped from the same mothership. Was it that we wanted to leave, or did somebody kick us overboard? It was dark, the water coming fast. We jumped in the sea, swam toward the only light visible. Life and death happened to wear the same size. No escape story makes sense if there's no night in it, or someone to blame for your constant bad luck. It's a call of the wild to spill out the guilt, not the justice. I never fear going crazy, but going numb instead, or getting sea blues. We stare at the other side of the ocean, waiting for any sign that says we're still important to somebody. Nothing moves. Overhead, the moon, like a big yolk in a gigantic plate, gleaming its quiet wisdom. The silence is impatience. The silence is never peace. The next poem is called White. Last night, while we were asleep, a hand threw all the snow over the neighborhood and left. Landscape imperfection suddenly vanished under soft white curves, the way your regret hides under a brand new tabula rasa. The street seduces us to be more creative, or is it our minds? Write something on you here, or at least take advantage to sculpt the kitsch of a future. Look how fast it melts in the warmth of your hands, how quickly it turns to water. Of all pleasures, the most fragile, possession, of all pains, the most bearable and irreversible loss. And the last poem I'm going to read is called Zafas Burdens, from where the title is taken off. <laughs> uh, this poem is based, I'm just going to say a few words about this, just to make it more familiar, it's based on the uh, on uh, a very ancient Albanian legend of Rozafa, the wife of the youngest of three brothers who built a castle in Shkodo, the city of Albania. Rozafa was intoned in the role to ensure the castle was created. The Albanian word for love is Rozafa, the wife which feels relatively long since the stress comes on the third syllable, thus extending the last and was intoned in the role to ensure the castle was created. Rozafa's to the memory of Megan Gazalea. Tell me this is a joke. I thought, I thought you loved me. Instead, I'm sad to die. My heart still pumps blood. The milk is flowing out of my right breast. 
but only the right eye is allowed to watch our one-year-old son. True, we've had our ups and downs. But do you have any idea what it's like to share a life with pen and write and see your thoughts not even once? Yet I never said a word. I never sought pleasure anywhere else. In our language, love happens to be a very long word. I have been careful to swallow the last letter so that falling into it would have hurt it much. I thought there was nothing worse than a broken heart, but now I'm not sure anymore. I had my own plans that day, but I was sent unwillingly to be a martyr. No more worth than a brick. The burden I carry on my shoulder is heavier than a weight of the city. I didn't have a good life, nor a proper death. Time is not a number, just a mixture of faces. Years go by and more people doubt our tale. I often hear them say as they visit my grave, this is not a wrong time, wrong place story, but one of murder. I cry silently. For a second, I wish you were here saying otherwise. How much longer will this story live on, stuffed with mystic virtues? I'm just a logo, not a hero. Tired of immortality, stuck in this eternal trap, punished to think of you inevitably. <laughs> Okay, next up we have The Eel by David McKinnon. Uh, I'm going to say a few words about David and about his book, and then we're going to turn it over to the video. David McKinnon was born in Canada and currently lives in Amsterdam with his wife and children. Uh, he has worked as a lawyer in oil fields, in factories and warehouses, in morgues and operating rooms, lumber yards, shipyards, and construction yards. Uh, I think David has had a more interesting, uh, varied life than anyone I've met in a really long time. Uh, to give you some examples, in an interview with Open Book Toronto, David gave a few facts about his life in writing, and here are some of them. The secret police once tracked me in an Indian Ocean country run by a dictator and his cronies. I was held at machine gunpoint by Italian Carabinieri during the abduction of President Aldo Moro. I once had to sell my 3,000 book collection to pay for food, one by one, and in reverse order of preference. I have had a hit put out on me. I have been stabbed. I moved to China three weeks after the 1989 Tiananmen Square uprising. I have a leaf from one of the eight original olive trees in the Garden of Gethsemane. I listen to a voice inside my head, and it's my own. <laughs> David has written nine novels. The most recent, Leopard Tango, was published by Guernica in 2013. Uh, and the novel was named uh, Joe Hartlaub's uh, Favorite Book of 2012. It was also nominated for a Busher Khan Anthony Award in 2013. Uh, David has been compared to writer William Burroughs and Glamour France stated that he has a talent for the absurd and a mastery of language reminiscent of Henry Miller. Uh, his new book, The Eel, leaves a similar impression. The novel focuses on the life, or uh, more accurately, the death of um, French poet Blaise Sendrars. Uh, now, Sendrars was a vagabond poet and the co-founder of French modern poetry. And in one of his uh, quatrains, he expressed a desire to have his ashes scattered over the Sargasso Sea after he died. Uh, now, that didn't happen. St. George died penniless. He was buried in the vault of one of his friends, and his wish was left unrealized. So in this book, we move uh, forward 50 years after St. George's death to a character named Jack Fingen, uh, who sees a major opportunity to finally realize this wish by transporting uh, Sandra's ashes to the Sargasso Sea. And as you can imagine, what follows is um, a series of events that are both surprising and wild. Uh, I'm going to leave it at that, and we're going to screen David's video for you, in which he'll talk a little bit about the book. He'll do a short reading. Um, so let's turn it over to the video. I'm going to read you an excerpt uh, from my latest release, The Eel, a historical novel about uh, Les Sondheimers, the French uh, very modern poet. Uh, 
This story is about a man who decides he is going to transport the ashes of the psalm verse to the Sargasso Sea. The fulfillment of psalm verse is testamentary wishes, which I'll read to you. I will be a man fulfilled until when my time comes, I can disappear anonymously and without regret. At the originating point of our world, Sargasso Sea, where life first burst in the depths of the ocean floor, and where it's the sun. <coughs> he saved me. Saltar said it is. Not for what he was one armed legionnaire, millionaire, three times over, bankrupt. Tracker of African Brazilian tales, inventor of French modern poetry, thief of Chagall's paintings, drinking power from the Vigliani, Vagabond. Ah, uh, wait, that word begins this story. Vagabond. That came on the message from the farm. It's a way out of this shit. This impossible problem of the If you were serious about breaking the shackles, you didn't plan. You went into a trance. You surrendered to voodoo. Otherwise, you would just grab the new chains. Solcar is the legend. A friend of gypsies and gangsters. A whaler. A warrior. Leave all that to the literature. When you're lying down before sitting in a supine position, the illness is removed, your very manhood, the ability to move. Fuck. The ability to fight and to fend for yourself. In other words, what a man is meant to do. When the world leaves you as a blotting harness, and finishes the job off with Christian pity. You don't need a legend. You need to go into a trance. Okay. You need to see yeah. One of the great things about Salkar's writing and his life is he, he conveys the intensity of uh, some of the world's capitals and places when there's a lot of action going on. So you find him in the 1905 revolution, you find him in World War I, you find him uh, crossing on uh, transatlantic boats. And basically, he was looking for trouble, and so was I, uh, to be quite honest. And when I drifted over to 1989 China three weeks after Tiananmen Square, and uh, I got it in uh, the barrel phone. But all I needed and more, I barely made it back alive. Uh, very happy to make it. But uh, this next passage uh, is meant to convey some of the intensity uh, and the corruption that was very attractive to anybody over there at that time. At that time. I had just finished a bottle of vino verde in half a dozen plates and bowls, seafood in an open door cafe with a dirt floor. Lay Fouclan and I were moving along the route of La Felicidad in Macau. The air was thick with an acrid vapor that enveloped us, and the big dirt alley we turned onto littered with mini skirted horrors, the lights of Friday night junks and floating restaurants illuminating the South China Sea, and Kowloon, marking the dark silhouette of mountain passes leading into Guangdong province. And I felt so alive, voluntarily abducted as I was from that cocoon of certainty, that nearly asphyxiated me with this policy of love and morality. And I felt that my lungs been pre-designed to feed off the fumes of stench. 
of horrors trampled upon by other men before I too would leave my imprint. And I felt that I couldn't get enough of this corruption. I lit up a cigar to stoke the cauldron within that was my soul. Ready for every sin under God's hemisphere, if only I got a taste of life. This accelerated life where every minute contained a neon and where the China night sky regularly exacted human sacrifices to appease the untamed passions of those in ether watching the theater being played out beneath. Salvatore is dead 27 years, now safely in Oregon. The realization of a secret right there for the taking within his name, and that knowledge blinding me with gratitude. But to burn the old self to the ground and rise as a phoenix, one first had to flee, food, the inseparable trinity, flight, death, rebirth, simultaneous, not in secret. For that to tear up his roots and flee, you must first burn your past to the ground, you must surrender to the trance, move into it, be swallowed up into the fly trap as you were surely swallowed up by China. And you flew the precarious last descent into old high tech airport. <laughs> the thing you have to understand uh, about uh, Salmkar is the theme that runs through his life uh, and his work is food or escape. And what attracted me first to the man was his description of his. Escape from his own family's chains at the age of 15 when, as he describes it, independently of my will, I went into a trance, uh, stole some cigarettes and some money of my parents, climbed out of the windowsill and just raced down to the train station and jumped on the first train going eastward. And that led uh, some cars at that age to uh, an unbelievable stream. He was he started out with things uh, in the first Russian Revolution, uh, guarding jewels for a traitor there. Uh, and this led to one of his great poems on the Trans Siberian Express, where he was uh, working at that time, moved on to New York, where at the age of 19, he wrote uh, a groundbreaking poem that just changed the face of poetry forever in France. And while he was starving to death, and went on to become a foreign legionnaire, he loses his right arm and learns to write with the left, etc., etc. Uh, just a remarkable life that I had elected to discover when I was uh, barely out of my teens. And uh, I, he was a great reference for me because it justified me wanting to leave the family mess at 15. And, escaping it at 17, and then leaving the new world forever at age 19. It, uh, Salkars saved me again. I was much later working as a trial lawyer in Montreal, and suddenly decided to move to China. The only person I could point to as a reference was Salkars. So it is this food and the ability to throw his former wives away, contained in his name, that is Songkars, which literally means the burning ashes from which he continued to reinvent himself and be reborn. And um, what I found really interesting because uh, Songkars' decision to continue to do this was actually born in his own division as a man when he was actually had a dual identity as with his born name Frederick Selzer, uh, which was the loyal of Salkars who fought in the war, and on the other hand, the revolutionary poet as Salkars. But after he saw the effects of modernity through World War I, that was the end of his conventional persona, and he became Les Salkars. And I think that that charts out beautifully the life of any artist is to assume all those contradictions into one person. It's my great attraction to the writing of Song Cars, but particularly to his life, because it took him time and again to become reborn. And I think he's 
he should be the reference for all of us because through his vagabonding, he uh, gives us an example of uh, the way to follow our quest to freedom. And, but interestingly enough, it is in a quatrain within his own work that he expresses that longing of finally ending up at the Sargasso Sea, the uh, place where in his view all life originated. And so that is what drew me to his life and also to the theme that you will read about in the email, which is returning the ashes of the song comes half a century after his death to the Sargasso Sea. <laughs> I'm going to read you uh, excellent. Okay, next up we have um, Weather Permitting by Planta Freddy, uh, who will be introduced by Sam Brown, actually. I didn't introduce her to you guys before. Um, so this is Sam. Please give her a warm welcome. She's the editor of Weather Permitting. <laughs> and she was actually uh, the publicist of Gwena before, so we're really happy you're here. Lower this to my height. <laughs> Uh, so when I first came across the manuscript for weather permitting, I was so impressed with the wide variety of perspectives and the insightful observations that each story within it contained. Uh, this collection of stories on a whole explores with so many different lenses uh, the topic of newly arrived immigrants to Canada and the angst, the agonies, and also the victories that they experience. Um, the author, Prashant Reddy, uses a lot of wit and turn of phrase to share many of the lessons that his characters learn as throughout the uh, collection. Um, Proudtop has been published in Canada, India, and the US, but this was actually his first collection, and I couldn't think of anything that was more exemplary of what this press is about, and uh, Michael agreed with me. So, Proudtop lives in Mississauga now with his family, and I believe he's already working on his next project. Uh, but I could not be happier to be standing here today and introducing him. So, uh, thanks. Good afternoon, Kira. Thank you, Sam, for that nice introduction. And I thank all of you who have come to attend this event. As Sam was saying, these stories are about new immigrants. The time when they have just landed in Canada, how they see this country you know, through their fresh new eyes, rather than like somebody like me who has been here for a decade almost. You know? And I would not see the way my characters see them or the way I saw them when I first landed in Canada. I'd like to read three excerpts from three different stories because it's the life of, uh, stories are our new immigrants. I'd like to read about the plans for departure from their home countries, that is India, the moment of arrival, and then looking for that holy grail, a job that will sustain them. So very difficult that, in fact, some of the people who landed with me in Canada 10 years ago, I'm still doing survival jobs, though they were engineers or things like that back home in India. So the very first excerpt, this is from a story called For a Place in the Sun. Immigrants coming to Canada to be in the sun. For some reason, the story is though it's in chronological order of departure, arrival, and then the search for the job. It's in the reverse order. Maybe all said and done, my stories must be read from the last page to the first. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Anant was whiling away a lazy Sunday morning, seated on an easy chair in the veranda of his house in Hyderabad, and reading the local daily, the Deccan Chronicle. As he turned over a page, an advertisement about a seminar on immigration to Canada caught his eye. He decided to attend the seminar and check it out. There was no harm, he told himself, in seeing what it was all about. Archana, his unprotesting wife, 
I agreed to accompany him. She combed her hair into a tight plait and wore, and wore a gold-bordered silk sari as if they were going to a temple. Anand kicked his best part of life and walked through the leisurely weekend traffic to the five-star hotel in Banjara Hills, the venue of the meeting. In an ice-cold conference room, which smelled faintly of mold, they listened to the talk on Canada while biting into sweet and salty Osmania biscuits. Anand was impressed, though the cost seemed a bit too steep. A lesser mortal might have been daunted by the landing fees, the visa charges, the proof of funds to say nothing of the consultant's hefty cut. But Anant was made of sterner stuff. He was an accountant by profession. After returning from the seminar, he spent two long days doing some in his session, giving him a wide berth, went around looking like a worried puppy. In his mind, Anant liquidated his stocks, sold off his scooter, Borrowed from Archana's dad, his own dad was a little tight-fisted, and Anand had very little to do with him, and somehow managed to balance his books. In fact, he showed a surplus of 150 rupees. This was sufficient for Anand, and he made up his mind then and there to apply for immigration. Though Archana, nearly a homemaker, never asked him why he wanted to leave his home and migrate to a cold and faraway land, Anand somehow felt he was duty-bound to give her an explanation. Anand said, I slog from morning till night and look how little I make in India. To buy a small fridge, one has to set aside money for years. I bought, the, I bought this used Vespa, taking a soft loan from your father. Archana looked a little wary, but said, I know what you mean. And that's not the only thing Anand said. You know how much I want to be a writer. You have seen for yourself how difficult it is to get an article published in India. There are no opportunities here at all. I agree, said Archana. Anyone with real talent is not appreciated at all here. I want to put my talents to use. I, I want to. Archana finished for him. You want to find your place in the sun. In her mouth, the words sounded neither trite nor mocking. All her life, she had been tutored to think that a wife was a mere extension of her husband's life. It was no surprise then that she could echo her husband's thoughts as though it was second nature to her. That was how it came about that they applied for immigration and bided their time in a state of excitement that had an underlay of anxiety. But as months passed, their initial enthusiasm slowly petered out, leaving behind a feeling of restlessness. A couple of years went by before they got the letter from the High Commission asking them to have their medical checkups done. By then Archana was in the family way. So Anand traveled alone to Canada, leaving behind Archana and their newborn son. Anand named him Bharat after the founder of India, that is Bharat, perhaps succumbing to an advanced intimation of nostalgia. Now for the second excerpt. Of course, the character is different, it is no longer Anand. When the airplane banked, Toronto sprawl swung into view. And I had my first glimpse of the CN Tower, rising like an upended middle finger. The huge, but the huge butterflies in my stomach were only growing bigger. The aircraft swooped down and landing with a thud, raced down the runway. But as if having thought better of it, the plane slowed down and eventually came to a stop. Soon afterwards, some of the passengers shot up like jackrabbits and dashed to the exit, clogging the aisles. I waited for the line up to subside before I got up from my seat and pulled out my hand luggage from the overhead line, dragging the bag after me and balancing a rather capacious coat on my arm. I sidled out of the plane. I clutched the coat, the thickest I could find I could buy in India, as if it were some sort of talisman that would protect me from Canada's notorious school. After a long trek through a seemingly endless corridor, I waited in a cavernous hall with a plane load of landed immigrants, men, women, and their cranky children. When my number was called, I entered a small cell. The border official took my Indian passport and the snot green landing paper and checked every line in them, periodically looking up to examine my face so intently that I half expected him to whip out a pair of, pair of handcuffs and slap them onto my wrist. But he was more interested in the proof of funds I brought with me. Satisfied with the loot, he said, welcome to Canada. <laughs> I collected my oversized bag and stood in the lobby of Pearson International Airport, sweeping my searching gaze in a semicircle 
over the multicultural collection of faces of people waiting for their near and dear to emerge. Some in the crowd had surgical masks tied to their faces. I remember reading in the papers about flu outbreaks in Toronto. Praful Patel, the owner of the guest house I'd be staying at, had promised to receive me for a fee, of course. There was a fair sprinkling of South Asians, but I managed to lock on to his unsure, half smiling face. He looked older than the J JPEG image he had sent me. A few days before leaving for Canada, I had surfed the internet looking for some sort of accommodation that wouldn't be too expensive. Checking into a hotel was out of question. As to friends and relatives, I had none. On the web, I found an not so flattering review of the hotel guest house. It was a pension like setup where immigrants could avail themselves of its frugal hospitality without getting gouged. I'm not the type to be much credence to all the reviews one encounters on the net, so I booked myself a spot. I was thankful to have an inexpensive place to go to straight from the airport. Rahul extended his hand and said, did you have a pleasant journey? Taking his hand, I nodded. Though I, I wouldn't call traveling 20,000 miles in 24 hours with two extended layovers and not much sleep pleasant. Rahul took control of the trolley and we walked to the parking lot. The spring evening was bright, but it still had a nip to it. I had my overcoat a little tighter. Rahul, who was dressed in golf shirt and shorts, seemed impervious to the weather. Once the suitcases were stored in the trunk, I went around and stood on what I thought was the passenger side. Rahul, too, materialized on the same side. Sorry, I said. I forgot you drive on the wrong side in this country. <laughs> no problem, said Rahul. There are many things in this country which are the exact opposite of what you would find in India. You will get used to them. And then this is the story about the immigrant search for a job. Ramati and his family arrived in the spring of that year and rented a basement apartment in Mississauga. Soon their dimly lit and viewless underground home flaunted the smell of curry like a newly acquired accent. No sooner had they unpacked their enormous suitcases, all six of them, Ramki started to look for work. He had realized pretty quickly that the money they had brought into the country wouldn't last them forever. But however much he tried, he failed to find a job, let alone one in his cherished field of electrical engineering. Lata said, do you think it will help if I too started looking for a job? Lata had never worked in her life before. I doubt it, Lata, said Ramki. Even if you had a hundred years of experience, it wouldn't matter. They only care for Canadian experience. But what the hell? There's no harm in trying. Ramki knocked together a one-page resume for Lata on a computer in the local library. Lata went around the nearby malls, handing out copies of her resume to the skeptical-looking staff of every shop that had a now hiring placard stuck on the front window. When she was offered a position as a crew member in a Wendy's outlet, both of them were quite astonished. Lata took the job, even though the menu featured beef, an item tabooed by the religion. But the relief was still good. Anus, Lata said, Anu's kindergarten class is for half a day only. I can't leave her and go to work. Ramki said, I look after her when you are away, but his voice belied his optimism. No, said Lata, you must look for a crush or, some, or somebody who can take care of her. You have a point there, said Ramki. I can't stay at home and look for a job at the same time. When they made inquiries, they found the cost of daycare so astronomical that it made no sense for Lata to surrender almost all of her earnings to a childcare center. Feeling helpless and frustrated, Ramki decided on an impulse to send Anu, his daughter, back to India to live with her grandparents. Lata said, you don't mean that, do you? Ramki said, it, it will only be a temporary arrangement. Lata said, even then, living here without Anu is unthinkable for me. Ramki said, life here is not as easy as we had thought, Lata. Neither do we have any relatives here who might give us support. Lata said, you might as well go back to India if that's the case. Ramki said, Lata, I've spent a fortune to immigrate to Canada. We can't return as if we are failures. Come what may, I'm going to succeed. 
I'm sure in a couple of years we'll be able to stand on our feet again. So stop my hearings. I'd like to thank the people who helped me to become a writer, you know, or rather, become a writer to an author. First of all, I'd like to thank my colleagues at Great West Life who have come here in large numbers, who have supported me, though they have picked me up. I was working as a security guard in the middle of the night because then Great West Life saw something in me and then hired me. So I'm ever and eternally grateful to them. Thank you for coming here to support me. And I would also like to thank Diaspora Dialogues, which gives help and assistance to new writers like me, especially writers who are of visible minority. And there are so many friends, which I found gasping the first time, and the Mayan but who are always there with me with their, with their help, with their uh, advice and support. Last but not least, I would like to thank Gernika, Michael Merola, and also my editor. In fact, in all these years, I always dreaded the idea of, uh, you know, the, the editor. But thank you, Sam. You made that journey so pleasant. And, uh, and that's it. Thank you all for coming. Here. Uh, and that is uh, the translated works of the Dutch poet Baron Lef. Uh, and actually the first book of Baron Lef's poetry to be translated into English, so we're really excited to be able to bring this to an English audience. Uh, Baron Lef was born Hendrik Dan Marsman in 1937 in the Netherlands, and he took the, pain, uh, the pen name of Baron Lef after a blind 8th century Frisian bard. Uh, he passed away in 2012, age 75. Baron Lef was uh, truly one of the greats of Dutch literature. He won his languages coveted PC Hooft Prize for the entire body of his work until that point. Um, and though his, his literary debut was as a poet in 1960, it was really as a novelist that he reached a wide audience in 1984. Um, what else can I tell you? Baron Lef is also a musician uh, and has published essays on jazz, painting, modernist art, on poets and poetry, and he was an editor of two previous Dutch journals of experimentalist texts. He has been the subject of a Dutch documentary feature film. In Poetry International, Miriam van Hengel called Baron Lef an avid onlooker and explained his poetry like this. Baron Lef's poems express the wonder of an outsider, a passerby. He looked for that which is unfinished and uncertain, for possibilities rather than facts, for temporariness rather than eternity. And the book was translated by Scott Rowlands. Uh, Scott Rowlands was born in New York and settled in the Netherlands in 1972. He has been a cultural entrepreneur in music, literature, and documentary film for more than 40 years as translator, editor, writer, publisher, and music maker. He has published three books of his own poetry, including Borderline with Guernica and Night. So again, we're going to turn this over to Scott Rowlands, who will speak to you himself a little bit through video. <laughs> Hi everyone, Michael, Lola, and Anna. Guys, so thank you for uh, asking me to send a little video. I'm sorry, I can't be with you guys today. I'm in Amsterdam, where I live, and have been since the 1970s. Um, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the, the history of how this book came into being. A still life, selected poems. Fair enough. Uh, back in the 90s, uh, I had spoken to Antonio D'Alfonso at the time of the publisher and we're about doing a book in the essential translation series. And he kind of consented, and uh, I had done a, a number of translations of Bella's work up until then, so from 1960 to 95. 
But for one reason or another, the, uh, it got put on the back burner. And many moons later, fast forward to 2012, I finally actually finished the project and, and asked again if were interested in the book after all these years. Um, in the meantime, I read more of Merlin's books uh, from 95 until 2010 and updated my old translations, many of which at the time I had the uh, opportunity to go to Bernhoff. The interesting thing about Bernhoff was he was a musician as well, a very talented jazz pianist actually. And a translator in his own right. And when I sent him the final manuscripts, uh, I remember saying to him, I said, hey, I know these are my translations are, are, are covered in songs. I hope that they've been able to capture the rhythm of the music and the song, which um, translation being a kind of creative reading, if you like, and a recreation of your own language of what you find in the original. And as I said in the introduction to the book itself, um, I often felt like a cannibal. I uh, uh, wish I'd written these poems myself. You make them your own. I, I, I really enjoy the way Bandoff perceives the world and works with language in, in a sense of the very simple, down to earth language. He can really evoke thoughts. As fate would have it, I sent him the final manuscript and asked him if he would uh, have one more look through it. And he said, oh, I'm sorry, I don't think I'll be able to do it. go through everything with a fine tooth comb. But he was very pleased that this book would just see the light of the day finally. Uh, and four days later, he passed away. The book itself covers his entire oeuvre from the beginning of 1960 until two years before his death. There have been some posthumous poems that have been since. But this is a good cross-section of the man's work. The next thing for me is you'll discover worlds behind worlds that look apparently where said on the surface of things. And he's down to earth about it. Um, Read the book, please. I think I'll just read some of his poems to see, give you some idea of who Bear Left is. The first poem is called Assignment, and it's actually the first poem he said he wrote as a young man. Studied tongue in cheek. Assignment. The more you think of dying, the better you will live. With a razor blade, it's conceivable twice a day. With a bread knife, you can fix your midday snack. With a gas hose, you can cook red cabbage in half an hour. The bathtub is possible once a week with a lot of lather. If your belt is busted, you can do it with a rope. Uncle Carl, a home movie. Saw a home movie today. Uncle Carl caught unawares in a small boat near the lakes. Three weeks later, he was dead. No longer susceptible to cellular. How good it would be to have a movie of his dying. Projectionist. Reeling off his last breath in slow motion, the fogging of his eyes, the falling of that hand along the iron bedstead, showing it again and again, for a top speed, so that Uncle Carl's dying would take on something very a rollicking dance on the creek of the bed, a race of an invisible woman who kisses him away by the hand. The eyes again turn their wheels, looking into the lens. The 
and wanted to be on the cards. Against the stream of experiences like the salmon with its swishing tail, slithering upward along sea stones to bathe in the open water above, you are too weighed down for that purpose. <laughs> What you see is both loss and curiosity, being totally engrossed in a single act, grabbing the white rain. Now the world is hard, now it's soft. You can't focus yet, cross eyed now and then. Long ago, which is a token black, the snapshot of a baby and a little boy. Is that really me? Yeah, it sure is. Someone wrote my name and date of birth on the reverse side, wanting to go back and not being able. You have to engage in diversionary tactics. Dismiss any notions of reaching goals. Head from the shoulder of a winding country road. And stare at the parachuting scenes of the heavy line. Then maybe, just there, and then only for a fleeting second. I wish you all a very pleasant presentation of the book projects. Thank you very much again for the opportunity. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Ara. Have a good day, everybody. Bye. Okay, we're going to take a quick little break right now, 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, feel free to grab a drink from the bar, the bar is just down there. We'll be coming around with some refreshments, so don't venture too far away. They're always delicious, so uh, stay tuned for those. The bathroom is just down the hall here to the right if you're looking for the bathroom. And as I mentioned before, uh, books are for sale uh, back at the back of the room where Michael's sitting. Now is actually a really good time to grab one of the authors if you want your book signed. We do have some time for this at the end of the event, but. Um, He's a little hectic, but move around. So grab your authors, get your book signed, and we'll see you back here in a minute.
And that can be concerning. On the other hand, it's also a radical participation. Okay. Oh, I didn't do this. I don't know what it's like. 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 Saints and songs are all the years. I wrote the piece of the first place. 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 I wrote the piece of the Okay, I think it's a lot of I'm pretty sure got something like that. This is pretty nice, right? Yeah. Two other things. Absolutely, yeah. And these are the kind of people. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
it's a white card, it's a testimony. Um, it's an article of which the human history works in the literature. And the third one is the other one has some other competition for a false
Hi, everybody. Uh, it's my honor to introduce Diane Brassett. So, uh, um, short stories, middle aged boys and girls, and being launched today. Diane is an award winning author whose work has been published extensively in leading literary and mainstream magazines. Her story, Donut Eaters, was the winner of 2015's Prism International Creative Nonfiction Award and was recently nominated for a National Magazine Award in the Personal Journalism category. It has been stated that Diane has a gift for creating memorable characters and for writing the unexpected. The people in her works come alive, become relatable, they are individuals that we know. Eva Stachniak has called Diane's work probing fiction, a worthy read that explores the crossing of the threshold between youth and middle age. Please join me in welcoming Diane Brassett. Under a sign saying orders, 
and waited for one, two, or three of the dead to spring up and help her. But they calmly continued working, punching instructions on computer screens, unwrapping bricks of paper, not paying attention. Newness in anything, whether a country or a culture, had always intrigued me. With a detached curiosity of tourists who has just entered unfamiliar terrain, she observed a novel panorama of a group of males who, to all intents and purposes, appeared to be oblivious to her. Of course, she didn't expect to make the same impact she once had. The last article written about her four years for the great county paper said she looked the same, but it thickened. <laughs> Such an ordinary word compared to the superlatives that had once been applied to her. Goddess, fantasy woman, and in a flurry of mixed metaphors, a tribute to her lips, in which the cleft above her upper lip was described as the fulcrum in a swelling course of praise. <laughs> now, thickened? These things didn't sound thick. She had laughed at her husband, Garrett, always sensitive about being perceived as another back model. As in previous interviews, she had tried to minimize talk about the way she looked, focusing instead on promoting her sister's country and mere calling her name, where her, where she and Garrett were working after a decade of living abroad. She set her portfolio on the counter. The clerk closest to her, a sandy-haired young man, glanced at a spot over her shoulder and extracted a binder from a nearby shelf. Place is busy, she told herself. Still, no place had ever been too busy for her before. In the past, spaces that always appeared in crowded hotels and restaurants with embarrassing regularity, along with the occasional complimentary bottle of wine. She was dressed in her usual understated style, safari pants and shirt, granny glasses, everything back. Now she found herself taking off her glasses and drawing them back on her head. No one rushed to serve her. The notion of having to draw attention to herself when she had spent her entire adult and adolescent life trying to bend it off made her want to burst out laughing. What did one do? Clear one's throat? Say, excuse me? The copies continued, the copiers continued their steady thrum, which seemed to exclude her. Slowly, I was surprised to disbelief. Jane unzipped her portfolio and opened it so that a magazine cover showing her in a leopard print bikini was clearly visible on the counter. The sandy haired clerk was instantly before her. Can I help you? He asked. <clears throat> I'll need a color copy of this, she said, slipping the cover from her portfolio. Body shots, her agent, whom she hadn't heard from in years had said when she called for this edition. The more recent, the better. Reddish ink patches appeared behind the clerk's ears. Is that you? Jane shrugged, the retouched version. His hand hovered above the photo. He was momentarily too flustered to touch it. Now Jane was aware of a familiar stir. The other young man not concentrating on their work anymore but stealing furtive glances at the counter where she was setting out another bikini shot of herself. Do you still model? Not if I can help it, she grimaced, trying not to think of how much she needed the job. Feeling ashamed about this, plus the easy way she had just drawn attention to herself, she turned almost sternly to an article about her conservation efforts in Nepal entitled, Beauty with a Cause. It looks like you got to see the world, the clerk smiled, picking up her bikini photos from the counter. Well, I didn't model for the intellectuals in the relationship, she said. 
The question every interviewer used to ask me was, do you consider yourself a feminist? Very much so, she would answer. Well, uh, how do you reconcile that with modern teens? By not allowing herself to be objectified. By refusing Hugh Hefner, who had asked her not once, but twice, to pose for Playboy. By dressing down in her personal life. By spurning the marriage proposals of nice rich men who offered to take care of her. Choosing instead moody men with a social conscience who blew hot and cold sexually, thereby confirming the hope that she was loved more than her looks. And last but not least, by being forever cognizant that her beauty had given her a free ride, and that one day it would be over. Thank you. to introduce Dane Swan, whose collection of poetry, A Mingus Lullaby, is being launched here today. There are few poets who are as poetically engaged and innovative as Dane, who has cited influences as diverse as Franz Wright, Tolkien, and Tupac. This is the second book of poetry that Dane has published in Guernica. The first is Bending the Continuum, a collection that has been described as equal parts can lit, Harlem Renaissance, the Caribbean oral tradition on its creationism, Roddenberry, hip-hop, and dark humor. Dane pushes the boundaries of poetry through his involvement with spoken word events, multimedia, and musical projects. Kathy Petcha said the following about Dane's work. He, quote, takes us from characters we know, are curious about, and poor, and leaves us with a greater understanding of the plight, strength, and intimacy of strangers seen through the eyes of a gifted poet. I expect nothing ordinary in his work. Please join me in welcoming Dane Swan. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. How are you doing? Good. Awesome, awesome. Whenever I do things like this, I always wonder if I should be thanking people or apologizing. So, um, Alana, my first editor, is in the room. Um, she, she's the reason I'm with Kornika. I'm sorry. <laughs> Michael, uh, he helped me with, he's our publisher. You should probably give a little bit of a round of applause for Michael. He's the man in the back selling all our books. Michael, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, we literally, for this book, we're debating things like, should there be a space between forward slashes? Like I was being a jerk. Um, Anna, publicist, I'm sorry for emailing you at the time of the week. Okay, enough of my apologies. Uh, thank you guys for coming for various um, authors and all that. It's exciting to see people who are interested in the word. Um, also, thanks to Supermarket for hosting us. I love this place. The sound is always awesome, so thank you very much. As a spoken word performer, I really love I, I, I get it, man. Your hard work and love it. Um, okay. I'm just going to read from the book. If you think I'm awesome, but you've bought too many books, that's okay. Uh, when I was in Montreal, a gentleman just gave me $5 because he couldn't stay to buy me a drink. I'm easily talking. <laughs> And I'm cheap date. Monterey Jazz Festival, 1965 versus Joshua chapter 6. God needed seven days of seven priests playing seven horns, circling the city of Jericho 13 times to make the city walls tumble. All I need is one eternity with one fresh status and one mint-conditioned copy of Meditations for Inner Peace. 
she needed priests with seven horns and seven days to do what Charles got Lani to do in one, create a sermon with his horn, become rabbi and pastor. Turn the masses into a congregation, lead them to conviction, raise them with the spirit, hold them to the chorus, have them bursting at the seams, wishing to testify, shake their souls, make walls fall. There was no holy ark of the covenant in Monterey, just an upright double bass that sang the angelic lullaby of a cello as our worship's introduction, a sonic miracle birthed from Mingus' hand. In her wisdom, only the relatives of Rahab, the harlot, were allowed to live. In his wisdom, Mingus became a pope. Everyone at Monterey was allowed to live. Apostle Charles was demolishing a different set of walls. She had Joshua order silence amongst her fathers for seven days before they veiled her soul to a cry. Seven days after Monterey, the media still were screaming of his arrival, not for a second his presence needed. Hallelujah! Hallowed be thy pizzicato strong. Praise the Lord! Preach to me, Lonnie! Testify! Call me blasphemous. Maybe it's because Ginsburg married him to his fifth wife. <laughs> because this half black quarter Chinese, quarter Swedish man defied the term race, yet they bought himself a yellow nigger, saw himself lower than the underdog, but still found a way to triumph than I knew. Worship him, praising his name. Amen. <laughs> Rule number one. If you are or are not a black man by identified as being black by white society, proceed with caution if you decide to live in a full white neighborhood. Rule number two. If you are or are not a black man by identified as being black by white society, decide to live in a full white neighborhood, do not start politically your plans to become a vigilante or one Negro man on Rule number three. If you are or not a black man by the for this being black or racist sign, decide to live in a film white neighborhood while stockpile and trailer plans to become a vigilant or one Negro man militia keeps said stockpile of weapons and ammunition a secret. Rule number four. If you are or not a black man by identified as being black by white society, decide to live in a film white neighborhood while stockpile and trailer plans to become vigilant to one Negro and militia which is not keep the stockpile of weapons and ammunition a secret to no fire so weapons inside your apartment because you're a film white neighbors are getting your victory for stockpile and trailer plans to become vigilant or one Negro man militia. Rule number five. If you are or are not a black man, but identified as being black by white society, decide to live in a film white neighborhood while stuck on artillery plants, become vigilant to one Negro man militia, refuse to keep such stockpile weapons and ammunition, and sacrifice their weapons inside your apartment because you're filled when you're getting your victim for stockpile and artillery plants, become vigilant to one Negro man militia, do not fire your weapons in front of a documentary film crew on camera. <laughs> <laughs> Rule number six. Oh <laughs> if you are or not a black man by identified as being black by a white society, decide to live in a film white neighborhood while stuck on trailer with plants to become vigilant or one Negro man militia to such and I keep some stuck of weapons and ammunition and secret fires or weapons inside your apartment because you're filmed white neighbors are getting evicted for stuck on artillery with plants to become vigilant or one Negro man militia doing so in front of a documentary film crew. Camera call your blonde haired blue eyed partner to pick you and your belongings up from the sidewalk so that she can take you to the neighborhood she could afford to live in. A couple blocks from the local Black Panther channel. Expect to never hear the end of the coming lecture about your choice of neighborhoods. You wouldn't need to stop tall weapons if you lived where you feel at home. When I came up with the idea 
for that poem, the whole, yeah, I'm going to turn run on sentences into a genre of poetry. I never thought of the repercussions of reading that. <laughs> You've been falling in love since little Oasia held your hand, making fools pay the women you love for love. Try to be true to love when honestly you're mistaken. Confused turmoil for love, anguish for beauty, success for hardship, kick loyal dogs away, pull vipers to the chest. I get it. You're an artist. I once stood at the exact same place. Take my hand. At your darkest hour, I shall not be light, just a person holding your hand. Opposite of everything you think you need. Imagine me dark, voluptuous, I'll become pale, slim. Push me away, I'll become your shadow. Yearn for LA, I'll take you to San Francisco. Elope with San Fran, I shall take you back to New York. Try to be misunderstood, I'll become your interpreter. Manifesting myself as everything you don't want. So when you yearn for me, you'll realize what love is. That's what it comes down to. That shouldn't have to say. They let you walk away, afraid to hold you. I refuse to leave, pulling you along the path. I carry your girth, letting go at the Ganges. Only then shall I let go of your hand. Thank you very much. I 
The first poet series was established in 2007 by previous Guernica owner and publisher Antonio D'Alfonso to uh, showcase fresh new works by poets 35 and younger. And the current owners, Connie McParland and Michael Marola, have continued to champion the works of young authors. And today we are launching first poet number 15. Steve Mahar. Steve grew up in Oakville, Ontario and graduated from the University of Western Ontario with a degree in philosophy and English literature. He also obtained a diploma in social work from Seneca College and currently works at a refugee centre in Toronto where he lives with his wife and his little daughter. Steve's poems have appeared in Carousel, the Nashua, the Maynard and the Ontario Ottawa Arts Review. And I'd like you all to welcome Steve to the stage to read from his first collection of brave and strange and gospel benedictory poems in navy blue. Steve. <laughs> Thank you everyone for being here, uh, it's a great audience and I'm really happy to be here with all the other authors uh, uh, to launch these great books that Karnika is putting out uh, this spring. Um, I feel like I have a little bit of pressure being the last reader that I really got to step up to the plate. <laughs> so uh, before I start, uh, I'd just like to say a quick thanks to uh, Michael and Connie and Alana uh, for really giving me a chance to uh, get my work out there. Uh, when I sent the manuscript uh, of these poems to Guernica, uh, I hadn't even had one poem published in a journal or a magazine, and uh, somehow they must have seen something in the work because against all odds they offered me a contract, and they've uh, really been so supportive uh, while we kind of crafted this manuscript and got it ready for publication. Um, also, a quick shout out to Gabriel for doing the trailer. Uh, as soon as he told me that he was going to set it to Bob Dylan, I said, do whatever you need to do. That's good with me. And uh, thanks to Anna as well, who's been keeping me updated on everything with the book uh, as it's come out this spring. So with all that being said, uh, I'm going to read three poems for you. Uh, the first one is called Peter's Dream. The way things used to be, when I wanted a bedtime story, Grandpa would read me the Bible. The Old Testament gave me nightmares. I dreamed I was an Egyptian with the lizards falling on my head. I dreamed I was a sinner and the punishment on its way. I dreamed I was Isaac on the mountain and Abraham had the knife. I dreamed so much. I even dreamed I was the apple. But I don't get stories anymore. Nowadays, Grandpa just says goodnight, 
Then he shuts the door and I'm alone all of a sudden. So now when I dream, it comes like a hurricane and I don't know how to stop it. I dreamed all the river fish turned up dead. I dreamed the east wind broke my pole in two. I dreamed the world was on fire and our house was burning and grandpa was inside taking a nap and the smoke was in his clothes. I dreamed I stepped in broken glass and the coyotes could smell my blood. I dreamed I was a soldier and the Nazis were after me and I was hiding in a pile of bodies and I was too scared to breathe and I could taste the skin. I dreamed I was a madman. I dreamed I was a scientist. I dreamed I was a leper and I was living in the canyons. I dreamed I was a cannibal and I bit off Banjo's ear and spit it in the lake and it floated like a lily pad and the catfish fed till morning. I dreamed I kissed the bag lady and my tongue went black and swollen. I dreamed I was being born with a rattlesnake around my throat. I dreamed a knife in my back. I dreamed a pistol in my pocket and a thousand chickens on the roof and a battlefield of blind children. I dreamed the North Star spoke my name. I dreamed I was in the medicine show and my mouth shot dust in Cowboy's face. I dreamed it was next Sunday and I was in church and the preacher was a cyclops and he had horns the size of fence posts. I dreamed I was real sick and my hair was falling out and the nurse kept feeding me jello. I dreamed Sweet Baby got run over by a truck so he had no legs and he wouldn't stop laughing. I dreamed I was dirt poor and my only friends were gypsies. I dreamed I climbed the tallest birch and I couldn't get back down. I dreamed I ate a spider for supper and it laid eggs inside my stomach. I dreamed a horse kicked me in the belly and it hurt so bad I crap blood. I dreamed I was Tarzan. I dreamed I was King Arthur. I dreamed I was combing the hairs on grandpa's chest. I dreamed the killer was licking my fingers. I dreamed I was catching water in a bucket and it felt like early spring, and the lightning bolts were lasers, and the raindrops hit the meadow like a hummingbird. I dreamed I had the shotgun, and the pigs were in the shed waiting. I dreamed I saw David naked, and he got real mad, and said we wasn't brothers no more. I dreamed I was dead at high noon. I dreamed the hangman was my father, but my mother was an angel, so I met her minutes later. The next poem uh, I'd like to read uh, is a poem I wrote uh, about, or I guess with, Toronto poet Raymond Souster in mind. Um, Raymond Souster, for those of you who don't know, was a poet who lived and wrote his entire life in Toronto. Um, he passed away a few years ago, but he was really a champion of poetry in the city. And uh, for me, he was a really big influence because as I'm growing up in and around the Toronto area, you always look for those writers who have come before you, who have written about the same things that uh, you're observing and that you're witnessing now. And for me, uh, Raymond Souster was definitely that voice. So uh, here's a Toronto poem entitled Souster's Ghost. Some write on giant oak desks, in fancy offices on university campuses, surrounded by chandeliers and marble floors. Some write bent over bar stools, swallowing whiskey to revisit the past and putting that blood straight to paper. Some write during the regular hours, settling in between breakfast and lunch, punching the clock like factory workers. Some write in secluded log cabins, overlooking sacred mountains and lakes, on nights so quiet, God makes an appearance. Meanwhile, I'm in the basement of the public library on Jane Street, with old volumes of Raymond Souster stacked up and spread out around me. I think of Souster's ghost, where he might be at this moment, what Toronto scene he's chosen this morning. Maybe rounding the bases at Christie Pitts, or watching the suits rush through the district, or riding the 501 from Long Branch out to Neville Park. Possibly at some greasy spoon-off blur, having coffee and eggs with Urban Layton, taking bets on when the late rates will return. Or maybe, if I'm lucky enough, he's wandering around the basement of the public library on Jane Street, taking a seat in the chair next to mine and leaning in over my shoulder, asking could I manage a few lines for him. Some write for agents and deadlines, for the paychecks cut by publishing houses and those shimmering trophies of reputation. I write for the ghost in my ear, telling me to get it down while I can, and for Christ's sake, make it count. <laughs> So the last poem I'm going to read uh, from the book is one entitled Oyster Knife. I am a desperate man. 
I tie my shoes in the dark while my wife is sleeping. Outside, I move like Moses. The tenements are burning. I carry the oyster knife. Only the stray cat sees me when I slip into the tunnels. There, I shake hands with the needy. I lay the maps on the ground. My instructions are a science. I light the Indian tobacco, throw smoke at the lions, paid out in gypsy blessings, then I'm gone, like clockwork. The streets carry me softly. I push away the bright lights so I can run with the poets. I say things to the factories, they seem to get my reasons. I play both sides of Sunday. Loyalty is a myth I crafted. I'm home before the raven. Her body keeps the bed warm. I can dream myself almost wholly with the knife beneath my pillow. Thank you, guys. to celebrate and support our authors. We're so happy you could be here. Thank you as well to all the authors that we launched today. Let's give it up for them. My name is Bashar, introducing our authors. Gabriel will actually be leaving us in September. He'll be going off to grad school to do his, um, his PhD. So we're very happy for him, but we will miss him. He's been a really great help to us uh, with a lot of things. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you as well to Salvatore Marola, who's also here with us today. He's our second photographer. He's an incredible photographer. He always uh, documents our launch with his pictures as well. So let's give him a hand of applause. Thank you to Sam Brown, uh, the editor of Weather, Weather Permitting, for introducing Pratap, and uh, thank you as well to Greg and the whole team of Supermarket. They're always very welcoming to us. Uh, they're, they're great hosts, so thank you for them. Uh, our authors do have some individual readings coming up, so before I let you go, I'll just tell you a little bit about them. Next week, Michael Morello will be in Montreal promoting TORP. Uh, she'll be reading at the Resonance Reading Series on June 7th. And then at Paragraph on June 8th with Timothy Niederman. On June 9th, Diane Brackett and Michael Morella together will be reading that word up in Barry. So if you can make it up to Barry, uh, it'll be a great, a great event to go to. On June 9th, another of our spring poets, Ben Uzan, will also be reading at the Indigenous Open Mic at Glad Day Bookshop. Uh, on June 12th, Guernica and the Italian Canadian Writers Association will be hosting Books and Biscotti, an event in honor of Italian Heritage Month. So we'll have a great lineup of, uh, of authors. If you're in Montreal, definitely something to look forward to. Um, in Toronto on June 12th, a few of our poets will be taking part in the Amazons of the Mediterranean at Black Swan Tavern, 2 to 5 p.m. A great lineup of us for of girls will be reading there. Sonia Duplacido, Darlene Mata, and uh, Bianca Lekaseljak. On June 19th, Ben will be reading at the New Members Reading with the League of Canadian Poets. It will be at Studio Theatre, Harbour Park Centre at 12 p.m. And on June 20th, she'll be reading at Hot Sauce Words at the Central and Markham Street. On June 25th, the local author's fair will be taking place here in Toronto from noon to 4 p.m. There will be poetry readings, book sale signings, refreshments, and Michael Morello will be there taking part along with Sandra Lewis, Whitney French, Linda Stitt, and others. On June 28th, Ben will be reading at the last art bar, uh, reading at Black Swan Tavern. So it's a very special event. The, the art bars will go on for a long time, and this will be their last reading. So if, if, uh, yeah, definitely check it out. Go. And on July 14th, Steve Mahar will be reading at Word Up in Barry. Um, ben, you had mentioned that you have another event coming up as well that I haven't mentioned. So that will be on June 21st. Okay, so Banu, Banu actually has a reading series of her own, Shabby Share. Uh, it will be going on on June 21st, and it's the most diverse reading series in Toronto, in Canada as well. Yes. In the world. <laughs> so go support Banu and the authors. It'll be great. It's always great. Um, okay. And also, I know that was a lot a lot of readings. I don't expect all of you to remember those. We'll be posting all of those on our Twitter page. So follow us. Uh, our username is wordica.ed. We post all our events there, all the details. 
Uh, we will be taking a little break from our launches for the summer, but we'll be back again in the fall uh, with our next launch in September, so we hope to see you there. I hope you have a wonderful summer filled with sunshine and literature. Thank you, everyone, again. Thank you, thank you for coming.